And welcome again to Living Light. Let me introduce you to Heather Axel Phillips. Heather Axel Phillips is an accomplished raw food chef who teaches classes throughout the Bay Area. She primarily teaches through Whole Food Market and Cafe Gratitude. Heather is a certified raw food chef instructor and graduate of the prestigious Living Light Culinary Art Institute. Prior to teaching raw foods, she has had years of experience in the food industry, including catering and kitchen prep. So please, welcome Heather. Hi. Thank you everybody so much for being here today. I'm really, really excited about this recipe. Uh, to give you a little bit more information about myself, I'll start off with how I discovered raw foods and it's in the region that we're talking about today, the Middle East. I grew up fairly overweight. My father is in advanced stages of diabetes and um, in my search to lose weight, to not end up like my father, I was looking for uh, something that wouldn't be a diet, something that would be a holistic approach to eating and I was not feeling as energetic as I could. I was sleeping more always. I was known by my parents as a very good sleeper, <laughs> sleeping way too much. And I was in the deserts of Jericho, actually, with my husband, who is Palestinian. And when we get together with his family, they all speak Arabic, and I don't speak a word of Arabic. So I pull books off of the shelves whenever I'm traveling, and I pulled a couple books off of my sister-in-law's bookshelf, had no idea what I was going to be reading. But when I got to the desert, I opened up a book that said, 12 Steps to Eating Your Addiction to Cook Foods. Some of you may know this, Victoria Butenko's book. And I thought, what a provocative title. This will be really interesting. And I read this book, and I said, oh my god, this is what I have been looking for. Um, I'm not a person who's interested in fads. I'm really interested in holistic approach um, to nutrition and to health. And immediately, I said, this is changing my life. I got back to the US, and I went cold turkey. Um, that was about three years ago. And, and I'm here to tell you about this story and many more stories of the Middle East. Um, the Middle East is a region which is in the news every day, but most people don't know very much about the Middle East. So I'd like to start off by telling you it's, it's um, commonly agreed that it's made up of 21 countries, um, from Yemen all the way to Turkey, including Iraq and Iran, through the Levant, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, down through North Africa, Tunisia, Morocco, um, and Egypt. And each of the regions of the Middle East have very different flavorings. And in the North Africa, we go more for the sweetness of um, including cinnamons and nutmegs. In um, the Levant, where we're going to be spending most of our time today, which is made up of Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and the Palestinian territories, um, it doesn't use, for instance, as many raisins as they do in North Africa, but we do use um, raisins, we use parsley, we use pine nuts, and a tremendous amount of olives, lemons, and um, traditional foods also include a lot of dairy products like yogurt and um, cheeses, specifically. Today I'm going to be introducing to you the king of all things stuff. That's literally what this dish is called. It's called Sheikh Al Mashi. And the reason why it's the king is because it doesn't use any rice. Uh, it really focuses on the meat. But in the raw food community, we're not so into the animal meats. And instead, I've developed a really delicious lamb-like um, meat that I'm going to be introducing you to. And before I um, go too deep into into the recipe, I want to tell you how I developed this. Now, how many of you have mothers-in-law who maybe don't eat raw food? <laughs> yeah? Okay, so maybe more than half of you. Well, mine doesn't either. And she came to the U.S., her very first trip to the U.S., and we were all excited. And she brought, like, um, maybe a half a bag of clothes and two large suitcases of food. She brought her grape leaves. She brought her zucchini. She, like zucchini, as if we don't have zucchini in the US. She brought her spices. She brought everything. And she spent days and days cooking. And she started off with dolmas. And I was so excited. I said, God, we can do raw dolmas. Would you like to try it? She doesn't speak any English, really. Uh-huh. So I give it to her. And she's so happy and smiling. She can't wait to try these dolmas. She puts it in her mouth. And you would think that I had given her feces. Her face just crumbled. And she spit it out. 
she barely even made it to the garbage can. She was absolutely horrified. I said, okay, I better start again. So I, that's how I developed this recipe was for all the mothers-in-law out there who really don't like uh, raw foods, who aren't so interested in raw foods, but who are perhaps open-minded, and I think, I think you'll really enjoy today's dish. Um, <laughs> it's got a couple of different components. Today we're gonna be making a veggie meat. We'll be making a tomato marinara sauce, both of which you can use independent of this dish. And then we'll be adding in a few more things to round out uh, the eggplant. And I chose eggplant because it's very traditional for the Middle East. And also not many people know how to work with it. So that's what we'll do to, be we'll do to begin with, um, is how to deal with the eggplant. You have a, a full recipe. And today, I've already made one that you're going to be eating. So what I have up here is a half recipe. Let me explain to you how to work with the eggplant. This is a mandolin. Mandolins are extremely sharp. They come um, with a hat that you often use. Today, you actually are going to be marinating. I'm marinating the um, eggplant, but I want to show you how to use the mandolin. If it's a big item, you can't really use the hat to begin with. So you take your palm fingers up and you slice. And then you put it back and you slice again. Okay, fingers up, palm down. And what you'll end up having is eggplant such as this, very thin. You can certainly slice it yourself, but you want it to be fairly translucent, okay? Next, you'll put the eggplant into a marinade. Today's marinade um, that you would make at home is a, a third of a cup of orange juice, a third of a cup of lemon juice, and two tablespoons of olive oil. So what I did earlier today was I took the pieces of eggplant, I literally just drenched them like so, and then put it on a Teflex sheet, and then put it in the dehydrator for about an hour or two, um, and you don't need, you don't need the, um, the full sheet, the, the one with holes will do just fine. And you'll end up getting something very soft and very pliable. Don't dehydrate it until it's crispy. If for some reason you do leave it in too long, you can always use a spritzer to spritz some water on it. But really you want it to be soft and very pliable. And you're going to find today that it's absolutely delicious. Now. You've got your lemon juice and your orange juice that you can get very easily, but then how do you decide on your olive oil? I wanted to introduce you to the olive oil of the Middle East because olives came from the Middle East, and in fact, in Palestine, it's believed that's where the olive trees originated, and today there's 2,000-year-old olive trees that are still there, so maybe they met Jesus. Um, it's kind of exciting. I want to introduce you to um, Holy Land olive oil, my husband and I import fair trade Palestinian olive oil. There are very few products available on the market that say made in Palestine, so it's really exciting for us to be able to bring it. And I wanted to give you a sample to try because many people um, are starting to believe, especially in California, that olive oil is as precious as wine and it has as many tastes as wine. So before you try it, let's have everybody get, get it and then we can all try it together because I want to just give you an inside peek at olive oil as its own entity. Some people, especially people who cook their foods, are used to throwing maybe olive oil in a pan and you don't ever really taste the olive oil. And today I'm giving you an opportunity to really taste and I'm going to explain to you um, how to deal with it. So olive oils come in many different tastes. Peppery, grassy, some of your olive oils are very, very mellow. Some of your olive oils are very, very spicy. And it can be fun to go home and have an olive oil tasting party and try the olive oils from all around the world. Tunisia is a very big producer of inexpensive, high quality olive oil. Spain is also a very good producer of high quality, inexpensive olive oil. California is new to the market and is making some of the most expensive olive oils you can buy and they are also very good and they're local. It's important that you buy your olive oil cold pressed 
so that it's raw. It's important that you keep your olive oil fairly fresh. Olive oil is meant to be kept in a dark um, container. I don't recommend buying it in glass that is clear because the enemies of olive oil are heat and light. So when you get your olive oil, take it home. If it's not already in a dark container, put it into a dark container. You can store your olive oil in the fridge if you like. Even if it um, gets solid, that's fine. It, as far as I feel, and my husband and the other, those in the olive oil industry, we feel like it doesn't um, hurt the taste, and it's just fine to preserve it. So the first thing that I want you to do is to smell it. Do you, can you smell it's got a pretty unique smell? A high quality olive oil does. If olive oil at home doesn't have a smell, it's probably getting close to rancid, or it's not actually an extra virgin cold pressed olive oil. The extra virgin cold pressed olive oil is what you want because this has the polyphenols. This has the antioxidant properties in it, okay? So first it's got an interesting smell, and then you take a very little sip and wash it around the outsides of the, or the corners of the mouth. And see what comes up for you. To me it tastes very nutty. It tastes spicy, and there's some grassiness to it, yeah? Yes, please take samples. It's important to eat a tremendous amount of olive oil. One of the things that um, my students ask me all the time is, you know, should I continue to restrict the amount of fat that I eat? My personal experience, I go through a bottle of this every two weeks. Okay, I go through a lot of oil and I eat a lot of avocados. I'm very sparing on the amount of nuts I eat because they're hard for the body to digest. These are very easy for the body to digest and I find that I get that vibrant health from eating a lot of avocados and olive oil in a way that I don't get when I eat the, um, say the desserts that maybe are very nut rich or, or some of the other pâtés that are very nut rich. So I really stick to using copious amounts of olive oil in my salad dressing. So if one thing I could impart for you today is to get yourself a high quality olive oil. I will be selling this afterwards. It's hard to find. It's hard to get out of Palestine, as you might imagine. Um, and uh, I also encourage you if, um, to try out lots of different kinds of olive oils and find which one you like best. Does anybody have any questions at this point about olive oil? Because I'll, I'll move on from there. No? OK. So we've prepared the eggplant. And next, I want to introduce you to the meat. I've developed it with uh, macadamia nuts and walnuts, although you could use other kinds of nuts if you didn't have them at home. The reason I chose macadamia nuts is because they're on the rich side. Well, these walnuts that I'm using are um, dehydrated, or they're soaked and then they're dehydrated because we don't want the enzyme inhibitors. It's important to soak your nuts if at all possible. In a pinch, of course, you can use them not soaked and dehydrated, but for your own health sake, it's a good idea to soak and to dehydrate them. So in your recipe, it would be one and a half cups of walnuts. And then three quarters a cup of macadamia nuts. In the store, you can buy raw macadamia nuts or the salted ones, buy the raw ones. So the first thing you do is, I'm just, I, I recommended that you put it in, a, in your recipe, put it in a container and just mix it up. You can do it like this and just mix it up very briefly and then you're gonna be taking half of it out. So I'm just gonna pulse. Let's see. Come on. It is on, and it is li lighting, so something else is happening. We'll do it this way. Okay. Awesome, thank you. I'd like to thank Andrew for helping me today. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. So just a little pulse and then I'm going to take half of it out. One of the reasons
reasons I was inspired to make this dish for my mother-in-law, who is from the little town of Bethlehem. She raised 10 children, feeding them in a kitchen about the size of this table. <laughs> and in a very traditional old home with a um, 300 year old home with five foot thick stone walls. And um, you know, I'm sure she did it on pennies a day. And I was excited to be able to give to her and to other people who aren't interested so much in raw foods the idea that you can make foods a little bit more healthy than the lamb that they love so much. So, you know, I need a bigger one of these, if you could. Um, so what I've done is I've pulsed this pretty fine, and then I'm going to be adding the zucchini to it. I've pre-shredded the zucchini using the food processor. You could also just do it by hand, that's fine. And I'm going to mix this up really quite well. You want to be careful to not over-process it but you do want to make it good enough. Let me have the camera zero in on that. Can you see? Let's see, I tip this. There we go, there we go. Is there the spatula? She hasn't, she left. I had to work on this for a while, but others in the family have, and they really have said that it's absolutely authentic and fantastic, which is really interesting and great. It was her daughter that had first introduced me to raw food, so I am excited to travel to the West Bank and to share it with them because they have our, my Vitamix and their dehydrator and you know all that kind of equipment that I might need. Okay, so next I'm gonna put in the rest of the nuts. Feel free to shoot me more questions, especially if you're interested in the region and some of the regional cuisine. I could talk to you about that. The traditional way for starting any meal is with your appetizers, your baba ganoush, your hummus, and you can eat it with bread or you can eat it with um, vegetables. This one, I'm not um, making quite as fine as the other one because it needs to be a little bit chunky. If you can see, how's that? There we go. Yeah. Okay. Then after you've had your meze, the family and all of the family dinners are very large. You know, you'll you'll have your extended family there, often 10 or 15 people seems like every night and then you have one main dish and the main dish unlike the meze tends to be um give that a rinse for me thank you tends to be quite heavy and that's what today is so after i've done the walnuts and the macadamia nuts and the zucchini i'm going to add in the rest of the ingredients so in terms of the rest of the ingredients i've got celery red onions, I made a flax meal already by taking um, golden flax and putting it into a coffee grinder and grinding it up. You can grind it up in a Vitamix and that's what we have right here. You have a question? I do make a raw baba ganoush, but zucchini, you know, um, eggplant is not an easy uh, vegetable to deal with. You need to um, marinate it first in a combination of acids with a little bit of olive oil. When you do that for your baba ganoush, you, um, you can make a good baba ganoush, but I don't make an, 
I don't make, near, nor have I found a really excellent baba ganoush. I, you know, in a pinch, yes, like with the hummus, you can make amazing, amazing zucchini-based or uh, garbanzo-based hummus, but not so much with the baba ganoush. Miso didn't come out here. Red miso, if you can find any. Okay, oh, it did, it did. Actually, I take that back, it did. Come back, come back, here's our miso. So white paper, white pepper. <laughs> Then some of the more traditional um, spices, allspice. I just want to call your attention that this allspice, I think, is the magic ingredient for this recipe. It's a lot of allspice, and it really rounds out the flavoring. We've got cumin, which is indigenous to the Middle East. We, you find cumin in, in Latin American foods and in other cuisines, but it's uh, originally indigenous to the Middle East. We've got... Um, salt, white pepper, and coriander seed. Nutritional yeast, which is going to give it a little bit more of the meaty flavoring. And sage, another one of the secret ingredients. Now, the mushrooms. The recipe calls for minced mushrooms, which you can certainly do by hand. But I think it's just as easy to do them in the food processor and I've been really happy with the results. It also takes on a texture that's not very even, which is what you want for a meat. If anybody can hear me in back, the miso has been located. There's eyes and ears back there the miso. You may already be f familiar with the flavorings, the typical flavorings, salt, sweet, pungent, oil, but there's another flavoring called umami. Thank you. Umami is a Japanese term for the comfort taste, the homey taste, and umami is really found a lot in, the, in meat products. But miso it also has wonderful, wonderful umami. And that is an ingredient. If you're ever making a recipe at home, you're trying a recipe for the first time and it's like not quite right and you feel like something's missing, whether it's a dessert or a savory dish, add a little light miso and it'll really add a spark to the dish, whether it's a dessert or a savory dish. Um, if you're not sure, just add a little miso. Okay, so the next thing that I've done here, according to the recipe, is I've added everything together. Now I'm going to make a little bit of a paste using the miso and some water. At home, you would use three tablespoons of miso. I'll be using a tablespoon and a half to form a paste. Yeah. If you can possibly use fresh sage for this, this dish, I would. You'll notice that later in the dish, I do use um, other dried herbs, but the freshness will, again, it brings that more traditional flavoring to it. So I'm basically whisking up the miso. and then I'll be adding it into the meat. Can I have a Teflex sheet? Uh, and so I'll show how to do that. Mix it really, really well. You don't want clumps of miso because that'll give you clumps of saltiness in your meat that you don't like. So the olive trees are indigenous to the Middle East, and for Palestine, it's the main economy. You can um, take green olives or black olives, and you can take them home, and it, black olives 
this is apropos of not this recipe, but I think it'll be helpful for many of you. If you get dry, the black olives at home that have been salted, if you soak them for three days, they're gonna plump up and get rid of the saltiness. You just soak them, but discard the water every morning and every night, and they'll plump right back up and be really quite delicious and would be a nice um, part of the meze if you're gonna be serving this, maybe with um, a Middle Eastern night of your hummus and um, some of your other dips and fresh vegetables, you can serve a, what I call a home marinated olive. You'll just serve it with olive oil, another high quality extra virgin olive oil. Pomegranates are a very little part of Middle Eastern cooking. They are more towards Iran and Iraq, so they're not traditional to the Levant area, although for sure pomegranates are eaten. They're not pomegranate heavy in the dishes um, the way they are in, in other parts. So this is the meat. We're gonna go on to the tomato. I need my equipment back. <laughs> if you can hear me back there, I need the food processor back. It came away, it left too quickly. Okay, in the meantime, hmm, I need to wait for it. Can I have the um, food processor top back? Thank you. <laughs> you could do this in a Vitamix, and I, and, but I think this will come more quickly. Let me introduce you to this tomato sauce. This tomato sauce is uh, from the Levant area, but it is inspired by um, the spices of North Africa because I've added some cinnamon and nutmeg and cumin to add a sweetness that will go with the savoriness of the meat. Thank you, that's awesome. Thank you very much. So it's primarily the tomatoes, bell pepper, and some spices. Okay? Is there a question? No? Okay. No? I hear something. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. So what we've got is three tomatoes that I seeded and chopped up. Now I want to show you how to seed and chop a tomato yourself. Knife basics are very, very important to be safe with your knife. So take your fingers and cut the, the thing down the middle. And then this is a tomato shark. We call this tomato shark. I like using it because it gets the seeds out really nice and easy. If you have a tomato that has a lot of seeds, it's helpful. Otherwise, you just put this in and go like this. Now, you could certainly use your finger, but it's more sanitary. And actually, you don't want to expose your finger to a whole lot of acid. So it's better to to use the tomatoes like this. And then for this recipe, you um, would always claw your fingers in so that if you cut yourself, it's not the tip of your finger, it's your knuckle. And you just do a rough chop, okay, to throw it in the machine. So we've got tomatoes. We've got already diced bell peppers. Then we've got sun-dried tomato powder. To make sun-dried tomato powder, buy sun-dried tomatoes that are as dry as possible. Um, Whole Foods carry sun-dried tomatoes that are a little bit more on the wet side. Many of the farmers at the farmer's markets actually do a better job at really drying out their tomatoes. That's just my experience. Then you put it in a Vitamix or in a coffee grinder, and it'll grind down to a powder. If it's clumpy and fairly wet, don't worry about it. It's just harder to work with. This is from the farmer's market, so it's nice and dry. And you can see it's a little bit more on the dark side. So sun-dried tomatoes are what give um, the dish a cooked texture. Anytime you dehydrate food, you're getting rid of the water, it's going to take on a, a lot more of a cooked texture to it. We've got a quarter cup of olive oil, and then we've got some really wonderful spices. I've put some cinnamon and nutmeg, cayenne, cumin, black pepper, salt, oregano, and garlic. The best way to take care of your spices is to keep them whole. 
And then to grind them as you need them, you'll really find that the flavoring is a lot more robust and multi-dimensional when you do that. You can, of course, buy them already ground, but I always keep a, um, a small amount maybe ground and then for a bigger dish or a dish that's going to be more special, I will hand grind and by hand grind I mean in a spice grinder or a coffee grinder that's just dedicated to that because you don't want coffee tasting coriander. If you um, could grab me an empty one of these. Oh, you did already. That's great. Thank you. Reading my mind. Okay, you ready to make the um, sauce? So you want to do this until it's a little bit chunky. I like it a little bit chunky. I think this is perfect. You can whir it until it's absolutely smooth, but I prefer chunky. There you go. There you go. There you can see. Okay. This tomato sauce is going to be really wonderful on a whole lot of other dishes. You can make this dish by stuffing red bell peppers instead of uh, eggplants. You can stuff it with zucchini um, and you could use this sauce. You could also use this sauce for your spaghetti sauce. I really, really like it as a spaghetti sauce. Um, you could use it as your lasagna sauce or um, any, in any other what might be traditional Italian dishes. We've made the sauce and I want to show you how to finish up the meat before I start layering this up. To finish off the meat, you don't need a Teflex sheet. You can just put the meat directly onto um, a mesh and you'll dehydrate it for a couple of hours you can see that there's really no fuss, fussing around here. You don't need to spread it and take hours. Just kind of dump it out onto a tray and you give it basically two to three hours. Now it's really important that you don't dehydrate this too long because you don't want the, the meat to come out too crispy. I'm really excited about this meat because it has so many different purposes. I served it as nachos the other week. Some of you were actually there and uh, it was fun having it um, with nachos. We have in the Bay Area a meetup group that um, is very active and a lot of my students participate in it. So I brought nachos um, and I had made a nacho sauce and meat and I had made crackers. You can also use this as your taco filling. Okay, You could um, use this to put in your pasta or your lasagna. So this is how it will go into the dehydrator, okay? This is how it comes out of the dehydrator. You can see that there's still, it's still a little bit soft, but it's crispy on the outside. This will be what we're using for the dish today. Now it's time to finish off the meat by putting in a few extra ingredients. We need, we'll be putting in three quarters of a cup of pine nuts. Okay. And then we have some reserved parsley for garnish. Okay. So I'll mix this up. My spoon here. Pine nuts go rancid fairly easily, so I highly recommend that you keep them in the fridge. All of your nuts I do like to keep in the fridge, but especially the pine nuts I like to keep in the fridge. Okay. In case you're wondering in Arabic, it's snubar. That was one of the first Arabic words I learned. Because I was they said, Do you want to go for a walk? Would you like to see the snubar? So would you like to see the pine forest? I said, that sounds great. And so we did. That was the beginning of my love affair with the Middle East. Um, the spatula. Yeah. I put them flat on the sheet. Thank you very much. I put them flat on the sheet, and this was just to collect them. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely do them flat on the sheet and you just want them to be very soft and pliable. So first, put a little bit of your sauce at the bottom. You want your eggplant to come into as much contact with the tomato sauce as possible because that will further soften it and make it more tasty. So we'll do, you can do layers in any way that you like. I've put on the recipe one recommended, but I encourage you to play around to see what you like best. Obviously, this is a dish that is not an everyday dish because you need to make the meat ahead of time and have it ready before you even begin. But it is the dish that will wow your um, teenagers and your family members that think all you do is eat rabbit food. Yes, that is a really good question, Laura. Thank you. Yes, this yes, this actually lasts for quite a few days. I think I put five days, but I would certainly even take it up to a week. And what I love are the different components. You don't have to put the whole thing together. Um, you, you know, you can, you can save out some of your components to have later in the week. So you can have your lasagna or, you know, your eggplant casserole, but then later you can have your tacos because your meat has already been made. And this is a heavy on the meat dish. Don't feel like you need to put all of the meat in the casserole. You can hold out even a half a cup is going to be just fine and have that for your tacos uh, later in the week. So next I'll be adding in the meat. Someone's working on the samples. Awesome. And it is a fairly thick layer. And then I'll put some more tomato sauce on. I definitely am still experimenting with eggplant, but really I like the, stuff, the stuffed the best because like I mentioned baba ganoush doesn't work so well if you like this dish and you want to experiment with it more I would recommend making little um, bites bites with the eggplant I would take this eggplant and then uh, stuff it with some of the meat and um, then roll it up okay and then you could pour tomato sauce on it at the end when you serve it and it could be almost um, you know, little rolls that people would use with their um, fork and spoon. Why don't we bring out the samples as I finish this up so that everybody has an opportunity to try it? Finish up with another layer of eggplant. Eggplant makes good pizzas on top of the pizza? Oh, using this as a crust or on top of the crust? Oh, wow. I've never heard that. That sounds really interesting. I'll go have to go home. So the comment was um, that eggplant, thicker slices of eggplant make really good pizzas. Make, yes, me pizza crusts. I see. So she said, dehydrate the eggplant first and then put all of your toppings on it and it makes a really good crust. Okay. So the final touch is to add some eggplant and then tomato sauce. The recipe calls for um, three quarters of a cup of pine nuts to be added and you add that in as your final step once you've got the meat all dehydrated, okay? Uh, generally in Arab dishes, the pine nuts are almost always served whole. They're not chopped into, the, into things, okay? So this is how it's gonna go into the dehydrator and then it'll stay in the dehydrator for an hour or two so it gets thoroughly warm before you serve it. That's the king of all things stuffed, Sheikh Al Mashi. You'll feel stuffed after you eat it. 
And I think it's coming out. I know it's coming out. Let's see. Yeah, here it comes. Here it comes. So I want to give you a couple of other variations to consider. You've, I've given you some ways to try the dish um, in its little parts. But another way to do it is to go um, Tex-Mex Southwestern, and that's in your menu. Um, instead of, uh, yes, you take the whole thing. <laughs> you each get one. Um, you could omit the sage and reduce the allspice, and instead start putting some chili powder or some poblano chilies in there. I use lemon in the marinade, but you could use lime. And probably I would omit the pine nuts. If you want to go a true southwestern, omit the pine nuts and add some corn and cilantro. Play with the amount of parsley and go cilantro, and you've got some Tex-Mex. So how did it come out? You like it? King, king of all things stuff? Great. Yes, what's your question? Oh, that is such a great question. Thank you. The question was, how spicy is Mediterranean food? And the answer is not very spicy at all. Uh, certainly, uh, the Asian cuisine is much, much more spicy. You will find occasional spicy things in the Mediterranean dishes, but they're very um, specific. So there is not a liberal use of chilies. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons why it's one of the more popular uh, cuisines. Not only does it tend to be light and healthy in general, but um, it is tangy and zesty rather than hot and spicy. And for most people, when you're, you're throwing a dinner party, you want something that's going to amaze and wow people, but is not going to send them drinking off many, many glasses of water. I have time for one or two more questions. Yes. Do I have a cookbook? I do not have a cookbook. Stay tuned. I teach classes all over the Bay Area. That's really what I do. And unlike today's recipe, the recipes that I teach are very fast to make, don't require a lot of preparation. Um, so I really encourage you to come. I teach primarily in Oakland and Berkeley and in San Francisco, and you each have a flyer there. I teach probably five to ten classes a month, and my, everything's up on my website, which is rawbayarea.com. You can go in and see all of the course descriptions. Yes, one more question. How do I make dolmas? Well, that's uh, come back next year. Maybe I'll make it, but I'm going to keep playing with the recipe so that it's authentic because there's lots of good, very good raw dolmas out there, but not authentic raw dolmas. And what you have today, you give to an Arab, and they will be amazed, and they will be so proud of you that you took interest in their culture. It's not easy to be Arab or Arab American out there, and so the more you support your Arab friends in doing what is traditional to them, you're doing a very, very good deed. Yes. My website is rawbayarea.com. I'll be here all weekend. Please come talk to me. Check out my um, website, especially those of you who are out there in the web world. Um, you can find me at rawbayarea.com. Yes. I am selling the olive oil downstairs. I've got plenty of bottles for $14 each. And my time is up. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.